So I'm indeed Jason Ponton. I'm the editor-in-chief and the publisher of MIT Technology Review, also the chairman of the MIT Enterprise Forum, which, as Craig says, supports around 80,000 entrepreneurs all over the world in 28 chapters, uh, including Pakistan and uh, India and various other places. I'm going to take you through this year's top 10 technologies. We've been publishing them for 10 years, since 2001. Every year, we select the 10 technologies that we think have the greatest capacity to change the world. And it's an obvious question, how do we select them? Essentially, it derives from our reporting over the course of the year. These are the technologies that we like. Um, our track record has been pretty good. Uh, we were, I believe, the first publication to begin promoting very important technologies that now most of us know, technologies like big data, synthetic biology. We've had our um, mistakes as well. Around three or four years ago, I was absolutely convinced that social media and broadcast television and cable would become joined, either through the set-top boxes of the manufacturers or through the broadcast companies themselves, or even potentially through Google. And we were quite wrong about that. Uh, the broadcasters absolutely didn't want their content to be disintermediated, to use the jargon, uh, by Facebook or social media. But even there, we were kind of right, because most of us now sit in front of the television with a second screen open in our hands. Um, so as a journalist, I can say that even when I'm entirely wrong, we're going to be right eventually. So um, I'm going to take you through uh, this year's 10 technologies. And the way I'm going to do it is very simple. I'm going to describe a big problem, because that's where we first look. And then I'm going to look for a breakthrough. Uh, and I'm going to tell you the innovator who has pushed through that breakthrough. Sometimes the innovator comes from industry, a big industry. Sometimes they're a scrappy entrepreneur, and sometimes they're an academic. And at the end of each technology, I'm going to uh, tell you why I think it matters. At the end of it, I'll take some questions. Um, some of them are pretty controversial, and I hope you'll, um, you'll be displeased with them. We like to say that it's not a revolution if somebody doesn't lose. There's a real tendency amongst technologists to be uh, gland hatters, to be um, uh, blithe optimists about technology. But real technology revolutions actually do disrupt entire industries and ways of being. Uh, and when that happens, there are always people who are discomforted by it. And it sometimes changes the way we think about very, very basic human activities. So to begin with, deep learning. So the problem is with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is essentially 50, 60 years old now. It even dates back to the very orig origins of computer science with Alan Turing. And yet artificial intelligence has so far proven to be a huge disappointment. Google is investing the full weight of its 16 thousand data centers all over the world and is working with Ray Kurzweil, one of the great inventors, uh, one of the great futurists, to push forward an idea called deep learning. Deep learning is a me method of artificial intelligence that borrows from the way we ourselves learn. It imitates and simulates our neural networks so that the network itself can begin to recognize patterns. Um, the impact has been huge already. Uh, Microsoft, who is already investing in this field, just last month wowed everyone at their big Beijing conference by showing that they could take a transcription of someone speaking uh, in English, transcribe it without error, translate it into Mandarin, and then translate it back again into English, all with machine learning with only a 7% error rate. Uh, Google has used it to do matching for drug discovery. Uh, they recently taught the network to identify 10,000 different images on YouTube uh, and to recognize images that human beings would find it difficult to distinguish between, between different types of skate fish. And they did so with three times 
the efficiency and accuracy than had ever existed before. This is going to have deep commercial applications. Some of them we know already. It will make voice recognition much more efficient. As I said, it will make drug discovery much more efficient. But with all genuinely revolutionary technologies, I don't quite know what this is going to be yet. But essentially, I'm telling you that the 50 or 60 year dream of simulating human intelligence in machines begins this year. So ultra-efficient solar power. You know, the world's in an odd place. Um, I believe that anthropogenic global warming, climate change, is real. And I believe the science says fairly incontrovertibly that the reason is industrial emissions of the burning of fossil fuels. And yet today, less than 2%, 2% of worldwide energy output derives from advanced renewable sources, such as solar and um, wind and the like. 2%, and the reason is entirely cost. The cost at the moment of natural gas energy production is around 10 cents a levelized kilowatt hour. And against that, almost no alternative energy can compete. The energy that we'd like to see as the principal use of, uh, of alternative energy is solar. But solar is at around 80 cents a kilowatt hour. And the costs are almost entirely hidden in things like installing it, land leases. We've made the solar cells as cheap as we can. What we want is to make solar cells much more efficient. And this guy, Harry Atwater, who teaches at Caltech, but also has a variety of startups, has found a way to make solar cells 50% more efficient than they are at the moment. 50%, and that would make solar cells competitive with, um, with natural gas. Now, how he does it is very complicated. It's a field called um, solar plasmonics. But essentially, he has found a way to use the wavelength of light more efficiently. Um, in this, you can kind of see what happens. The wavelength of light bounces inside the solar cell. Imagine a ball bouncing backwards and forwards inside a gym. And it breaks the wavelength of light into a variety of other colors. So the wavelengths that are at the moment uh, gathered by solar cells have been vastly extended. 50% increase in efficiency. And what will the impact be? Well, as I said, I think it makes solar cells the first time competitive with natural gas. And it does so in ways that I think will be revolutionary. What we want is for alternative energy to have what we call its own economic imperative. We want them to compete against natural gas and coal and petroleum on their own, without subsidies from the government. And if we do that, we can begin to perhaps make an impact upon climate change. Big data from cheap phones. So this is my big data um, trend for, for today. Um, big data is being used already in countries like Australia, the United States, and in Europe to produce a variety of insights into how customers behave, how people behave. But what we really want is to know more about how the two or three billion people in India, in Africa, and China who have very cheap phones, what, how they use their phones. Why would we care about that? Well, if we, could, if we could begin to go and gather data from cheap phones, as Carolyn Bucky at Harvard University is, we could begin to discover very basic things about, about human behavior. And the impact would be fairly large. Uh, Carolyn Bucky has shown that you can predict malaria outbreaks, outbreaks of dengue fever so that public health organizations could respond much more efficiently. But you know, any really advanced technology can come to seem magical if it's sufficiently advanced. And I'll just give you one example of the application of uh, big data to cheap phones. So it turns out that the behavior of terrorist organizations as they use their cell phones is completely predictable. And there's a professor in Pakistan called Umar Saif, who can predict terrorist outbreaks, the explosion of an improvised explosive device, with 97% accuracy. 97% accuracy by just observing the behavior of cell phone networks. So, cool stuff. Um, temporary social media. So, 
I was at university before we had Facebook and Twitter. I think many people in the room were. I didn't much, when I was at university, I made mistakes. I did stupid stuff. You know, I got drunk, I did worse things. Um, I won't tell you all of them. But, but kids today, from the moment they are able to use a computer, they are making mistakes in public. There's a guy called um, Moot. Uh, Charles Poole, who founded the website 4chan. 4chan has some interesting features. It has no memory, uh, and it's anonymous, so that anything you post disappears in a very short period of time. 4chan's tremendously successful, and Moot says it's successful because it leaves a space for people to be wrong, um, to explore themselves. And that doesn't exist at the moment in social media. So temporary social media, of which the um, app Snapchat is the most common, is a mechanism of making our posts temporary. A whole bunch of companies are beginning to embrace this, with the exception of Facebook. And I think eventually even Facebook is going to accept this. Um, it is tremendously distorting to have a record of everything that we do. It's one of the reasons I'm very suspicious about Google Glass. When we talk to people, we're not actually monitoring what we're saying. It allows us to be uh, spontaneous, to make jokes, to be naughty. If you know you're on the record, you're much more careful than you would otherwise be. So the impact of this is that messages that quickly self-destruct would allow the freedom that has existed for thousands of years in human communications to rise up again. Now, Snapchat is a fairly rudimentary application. It's in some ways not the most advanced example of this. Um, anyone who knows how to go and use um, uh, freeze frame can take that picture that you've sexted to your ex at 3 a.m. in the morning and keep it. Um, but there will be better applications of it. So temporary social media is going to begin, I think it's going to begin um, roiling through the online world this year. Smart watches. Um, so I've got a problem with Google Glass, as I say. A, it looks dorkish to be walking around with a, with a computer on your face. If you've ever seen someone use it, they look like they've got Tourette syndrome. They're kind of they're muttering to themselves and tapping the side of their, <laughs> of their head. It looks really silly. But um, we want some way that's more socially natural to interact with these um, little mainframe computers that we've got carrying around. What we don't want to do, I don't know if you, people do this in meetings all the time, they sit there talking to you and they're kind of looking at their phone the whole time and it's infuriating. I think it's natural to want to interact with the network, but we want to do it in a way that is, uh, that's in keeping with the way human beings normally socially behave. <coughs> so I think this is the growth of smart watches. Pebble is probably the most famous example. It's also famous because it was the first big project that got funded out of Kickstarter, the crowdsourcing network. But um, there are a whole variety of these smart watches. Uh, it's not a very well kept secret in the valley at the moment that Apple's next big product is going to be a smartphone. And the impact is it's going to allow us to essentially download the information on our phones in a way that's natural. We can just glance at our phone like we glance at the time now. But there are, there are bigger implications than that. If you're wearing the phone, we can use it for a whole bunch of self-quantification functions as well. So self-quant is the movement that tracks how much you eat, how much you walk during the day. There are physiological signals on uh, the surface of the skin when a child with autism is about to um, uh, have a spasm of rage. So wearing a wearable computer wearing a, uh, a piece of smart information, either on your wrist or perhaps even one day in your clothing, I think is going to be a very important change. Essentially what's happened in the world is that information has become like electricity, ubiquitous but invisible. And at the moment, the only way we have of accessing the information is this, a device whose form factor was created to make phone calls. And there's got to be a smarter and better way. And as I say, Pebble, I think, is the first um, commercial application of that. OK, this is the most science fictional technology I'm going to show you today. And if you'd asked me, gosh, even four or five years ago, 
if it were possible, I would say you're crazy and you know nothing about human biology. So here's the problem. Uh, people get old. People age. Uh, and as we age, we lose the plasticity to uh, learn new languages. We become forgetful. And tragically, everyone in the room who doesn't have a specific gene is going to have dementia by the time you get past 70 years old. 75% um, of people who are admitted to emergency rooms after the age of 70 have some form of mild cognitive impairment. And we didn't know this in the past because mostly we died before we got very old. We died of diseases like cancer or heart attacks. But we now know that except for a small population of people who don't develop um, damage to post-mitotic cells like brain cells, everyone is going to get some form of dementia. So, um, a guy called Ted Berger at USC has shown that we can download memories to silicon chips. We can download memories to silicon chips. He's doing this in animal experiments with mice, with rats. He's got approval to begin trials with monkeys this year, and he hopes to begin trials with um, human beings in the short term as well. So let me say what he's done again. He's downloading the memories that uh, advanced mammals are creating into chips that he's inserted into the brains of, um, of quite sophisticated organisms. So why it matters? Well, initially the applications will be clinical. As I say, people who've, who've experienced profound brain damage or who've had Alzheimer's or strokes will be able to have their memories put into devices that are not damaged. Um, into things of glass and silicon. But a very little bit of science fictional speculation suggests that this will have profound implications for what it means to be human. As I say, we could learn languages late into life, but we could perhaps learn skills. You want to learn Spanish? Well, there might be a chip for that. Or perhaps you want to have memories or experiences you've never had before or to take memories and experiences away that you regret. So memory implants is the trend where Ted Berger has reduced the memories you make to ones and zeros, and he's found a way to store them. Perhaps our memories could be stored not simply in chips in our head, but out in the network, so that if you had an accident, your memory would be waiting somewhere else. I think this is profoundly science fictional, and like all really gigantic technological shifts. I don't know what it means yet. Um, robotic manufacturing. So conventional industrial robots are incredibly expensive. Uh, they have transformed big industries uh, like car manufacturing. Um, but if you've ever seen a modern factory, these million dollar robots sit inside glass, or forgive me, inside steel cages. They move very quickly and very dangerously. Uh, and they can only be programmed by people who are who essentially have PhDs in robotics. Um, for better or worse, if we want to continue to automate the workforce, and as I say, in, as in all real trends, there are winners and losers to these, um, these technologies, we need a different type of robot. We want a robot that is cheap, that can be programmed by people with only a high school education, and that aren't dangerous. So this guy, Rod Brooks, who was the uh, former head of MIT's computer science lab, uh, now runs a company called Rethink Robotics, has created a robot called Baxter. It only costs $20,000. So in its first year, it recoups the cost of what an ordinary human employee's um, salary would be, and it's perfectly safe. I mean, I, I've programmed this thing. You can teach it how to perform an action just by guiding its hand once or twice. And if it hits you by mistake, it backs away apologetically and kind of looks down. Um, it's very social. It's an amazing machine. And um, I don't know what I think about this as well. So on the one hand, it's going to bring robotics into smaller companies. It's going to bring robotics into stores but it's going to displace a whole variety of workers uh, in industries who have so far been immune from the automation of work. So 
there is a large debate at the moment inside economics about why the, um, the curve of productivity growth has been decoupled from uh, employment and wage growth. Um, this is called by economists the great decoupling. For the last 200 years, every time we've invented a new technology, um, eventually, even if it has displaced existing jobs, it has created new jobs and it has grown wealth. Um, this has been broken for the last 15 years as the wealthiest people in society have become progressively richer and companies have become progressively more, producti more productive and more profitable, but ordinary wage earners have seen their wages stagnate. And that's largely attributed to a mixture of automation, robotics, globalization. But some jobs have been immune in the blue collar field. Well, this, this changes that. This means that the last jobs in, um, amongst the working classes that had been immune from that trend of automation are about to be hit as well. So again, it's not a revolution if someone doesn't lose, and I'm pretty sure that some people are going to lose from Baxter. Um, I just told you why it mattered, so I don't need to do it again. Additive manufacturing. Um, so this is the production of complex parts. Um, this is 3D manufacturing. Um, at the moment, it's very expensive and difficult to make very complex parts. They normally have to be milled at great expense. Um, 3D printing has begun to make its way into a variety of fields like uh, jet part manufacturing, uh, into the creation of turbines. General Electric is the, is the leader in this field. Um, why it matters? It means not just that we can make parts that have hitherto been expensive to make more cheaply, but it means we can begin to make parts that have never existed before. One of the reasons why the Boeing 787 is so cheap, despite its high sophistication, is that many of its parts have been printed. This is a very different trend than 3D printing, as you've maybe heard it described in publications by Wired. When trendier publications than MIT Technology Review write about 3D printing, they're essentially talking about a hobbyist field where ordinary people can manufacture parts. But that kind of 3D printing is essentially just a form of rapid prototyping. This is bringing 3D printing into large-scale industrial manufacturing. Prenatal, prenatal DNA sequencing. Um, so this is the most morally troubling trend I'm going to show you today, at least morally troubling for me. So how many people in the room are parents? Most of you. So when, when your child was born, you had some uh, prenatal sequencing. Uh, we can't do much of it at the moment, but we screen for a variety of disorders like Downs. There are a couple of other things we know how to look for. A company called Illumina uh, has driven down the cost of DNA sequencing to such a point that it can now sequence the entire genome of a fetus from a pregnant mother's blood. The entire sequence. So what does this mean? Well, it means we can know exactly the genetic inheritance and destiny of your child. And I don't think we know how to morally deal with that at the moment. So I'm sure you also, about a month ago, uh, Angelina Jolie was diagnosed with a particular mutation on a gene called BRCA1. And it gave her around an 80% chance of developing uterine or breast cancer in the course of her lifetime. 80%, not a certainty, but a very high likelihood. And she had both her uterus and her, her breasts removed. We know what that gene looks like. We could have sequenced for the, the new Angelina Jolie, and the parents could have chosen to abort her before she was born. Now, in the Western industrialized democracies, there is a understanding that abortion is a right. But in no countries is it an unlimited right. No one believes it's permissible to abort a fetus in the West based upon gender. But now we could abort a fetus if it was in the bottom 50% of intelligence. We could abort a fetus if it had male pattern baldness. But what's worse than that is that human beings aren't very good about thinking statistically. So parents would be asked to make decisions based upon likelihoods. 
a 50% likelihood, a 60% likelihood. And I don't think we know how to do that yet as a, as a species. I think it's going to be very difficult for us to think it through. And you're not going to find that from the company. Illumina doesn't believe it's its obligation to provide any information about that. Illumina believes that's the, a conversation that will occur between a mother and her physician. So this isn't science fiction. This is on the marketplace today in the United States. And as we discover more gene markers for more, more forms of disease, it's going to become an even more complicated decision. 75% of diseases have some form of genetic expression. 75%. And parents will be under tremendous temptation to make decisions about the future of their, of their children based upon a kind of statistical reasoning that human beings are very bad at making. Supergrids. Um, you know, when they were inventing electricity, uh, Tesla and Edison had a great debate about whether the grid should work on DC or AC. And DC is a much more efficient way to go and transmit energy around a network. But when we invented our industrial scale grid, we couldn't commit to DC but because we didn't quite have the technology to do so. DC only worked for what's called point-to-point -point transmission, not for a integrated network. A company in Norway called ABB has created a practical high voltage direct circuit breaker. What that means is that as a part of the network comes down, it can be taken off the network. So you could build a modern DC supergrid. And we care about that because we will never have a renewable energy future without a DC-based supergrid. What we want is to be able to generate uh, solar energy in the Sahara and then transmit it north to Germany. We want to have wind farms in the middle of Australia producing energy and then transmitting it around Australia or through during the day. You couldn't do that at the moment. Our grid is a 19th century grid essentially. It's a dumb grid and super grids allows you to create a, a smart grid. So those are my 10 technologies for the year. I'll take a few questions. If you want to write to me personally and tell me I'm an idiot, uh, my, my email is uh, jponton at mit.edu. And on that note, thank you very much, and um, we'll take some questions.